Look at the clock. Look at the clock. Look at the clock. My life is my life is flying away. Look at the clock. <laughs> Before I get done, it'll be time to be back for tonight. Oh, that's very distractive. <laughs> you see the clock? It's very distract. That's very distracting. By the time I get done, I, I'll have to be back at six. I don't. It's, it's four fifteen already. I haven't even had dinner. If you would be turning in your Bibles to the seventh chapter of the book of First Corinthians, Brother Hiram introduced this last week and we're going to try to get through the chapter today I don't know how much success we'll have if you look at the clock the hours are flying by it's in a half hour we have to be back at six o'clock so I'm not sure how much time I'm gonna have that is very bizarre but that that really actually feels like my life <clears throat> maybe yours too as you get older but the Hiram introduced last week chapter 7 to us and he gave us three foundational scriptures that we will work from today. The first was Genesis, the second chapter, verses 18 through 24, where God ordained marriage. One man for one woman for life. The second foundational scripture is Malachi, the second chapter, verses 14 through 16, where it says what? God hates divorce. The third chapter, Matthew 19, verses 1 through 12, where Jesus talks about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. These are the three foundational scriptures that we will use when we discuss chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. And there was one that I added to this, Amos 3.3. 3. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? In chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, Paul will fall back on these three foundational scriptures. But you will find in chapter 7 that he never contradicts Christ. Paul, who is responsible for 75% of the New Testament, never contradicted Christ. And so he does not contradict Christ here. So we open, this, we open this session of chapter 7 and, and I ask a very simple question. In today's society, what sells? What sells? Sex sells. Does anyone disagree? Sex sells in our society today. How long can you go watching a normal television show today without there being some kind of sexual innuendo? How long can you go watching television today and not see a commercial that sells sex? Now take away the television, take away the social media, and you have the church, what the church looked like going out into the community in the first century. Sex sold even in the first century. I did a fair amount of research this week on sex and culture in ancient Greece. I did that so you don't have to. But if you want to, you can go home and Google sex in ancient Greek society. And hopefully you're sitting down when you begin to read about it. But you know it's not very different from today's society. Man and woman, woman and woman, man and man. Is it no wonder that Paul preached in the first chapter of the book of Romans about men burning in their desire for other men? Sex sells even in the first century. And so as Paul strolls into Corinth to preach to these people for the very first time, spending one and a half years there, according to Acts 18, he was confronted by a society 
that basically worshipped sex. Temples where men and women could go in and have sex as worship. Pedastry. How many of you know the definition of the word pedastry? It's not a term we hear about today. We've exchanged that term for the term pedophilia. Pedastry is an older man who takes a younger man from 10 to 15 under his wing, if you know what I mean. Every kind of sexual desire was given for whatever person wanted to do. So was it no wonder when Paul came to preach to the church at Corinth, staying there a year and a half, then leaving and going to the church at Ephesus where he preached for three years, that he would receive questions from this church in Corinth about sex, marriage, and what to do in these times of unbelief. The type of people that Paul would have encountered in his ministry, in his preaching, are the same types of people that we encounter today. How many people do you know that view pornography on a regular basis? How many people do you know today that actively swap wives or swap husbands with other people? In this community, how many people do you know that are having illicit affairs outside of their marriage? So as Paul preaches to these people, as he opens chapter 7, he's preaching to a wide variety of people. Just as when Neil stands in the pulpit or someone else stands in the pulpit of a gospel meeting, they're preaching to a wide variety of people. They're preaching to virgins, both male and female. They're preaching to single people who should be virgins, but are not. They're preaching to the married. They're preaching to those who have chosen a life of celibacy, those who have chosen not to marry. He's preaching to widows. He's preaching to those who may be outside the doors of this congregation or practicing some sort of aberrant lifestyle, whatever that may be. And so it is the same type of people that Paul ministered to in the first century that we minister to or that we interact with on a daily basis. Paul speaks in this chapter of the present distress. Your version say, may say the present crisis. I think it's about verse 26 is where he talks about that. The present crisis of the present distress. If we place this in historical context, a man named Nero has just come to the throne. And anyone who is familiar with Christian history knows Nero was not friendly to these people who followed Christos or followed Christ. And so in this environment of persecution, not only persecution that is just beginning, but persecution that will increase over the years, Paul writes this letter to the church at Corinth in answer to some of their questions. Questions concerning marriage, questions concerning the unmarried, questions concerning widows, questions concerning married, being married to an unbeliever. The same folks that we deal with on a daily basis that we see every day. And so this oppression to the faith which is beginning, he preaches about and he talks about in the later verses of the chapter. So let's break down chapter 7. It's a, it's a, it's a chapter of 40 verses. It's fairly easily broken down. Uh, my breakdown is slightly different than Brother Kemp's uh, from last week. I think he went down in the first section through verse 9. For our benefit today going through this, we're going to talk about verses 1 through 7. And that concerned intimacy and marriage. Verses 8 through 16, instructions to those who are married. 
Verses 17 through 24, marriage as a calling. And finally, verses 25 through 40, instructions to the unmarried. So let's begin in verses, with verses 1 through 7 as we go through chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. For I wish that all men were even as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. Let's begin back, up, begin back at verse 1. Concerning the things which I wrote to you. These, these are the things, these are the questions that the church at Corinth wrote to Paul while he was in Ephesus for those three years. And so as these questions come, he's going to address a number of things. In chapter 8, he's going to address food ordered, uh, food ordered, food given to idols, food offered to idols. I ordered food last night for some reason that's still on my mind. I'm not sure why. Food given to idols. But in this one, in chapter 7, he begins, concerning the things that you wrote me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now to touch a woman there, if we look back in Proverbs, to touch a woman is to be sexually intimate with her. It is not good for a man to touch a woman. So he here is saying celibacy is not a bad thing. But in the fact that he does not contradict Christ, marriage in the second verse, because of sexual immorality, if you cannot remain celibate, each man should have his own wife. So celibacy does not trump marriage. Marriage is still the ideal. Marriage is still Genesis 2. Marriage is still the ideal. A man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves unto his wife, and they two become one flesh. That is the ideal. But there are some who cannot marry. There are some who... Matthew, or in Matthew 19, Christ talks about people who cannot marry, who must remain celibate, those who are, <clears throat> who are, who are given to the ministry, those who have the strength of their convictions that can, re <clears throat> that can remain celibate, those who are celibate via some sexual dysfunction and cannot marry, and those who are given to, those who are given to the, uh, the, the preaching of the ministry of Christ. Paul says himself here, that he, is, that he has remained celibate. So uh, down, in verse, down in verse 7, he says, but he wishes that all men were even as he himself. It is very possible that Paul was a widower because in Acts uh, 26, he talks about the fact that he condemned people to death by giving a vote. And if we interpret the word vote correctly there, he was a part of the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin one of the requirements to be a part of the Sanhedrin were that you be married. And so Paul is no longer married. He says, that, wish that you were as I. And he's, he's not married anymore. He is a, he's probably a widower. And so he has found in the celibate lifestyle his way toward preaching the gospel. And that was, that was the way for him. But he says, nevertheless, in verse 2, nevertheless, despite this fact that it's not good for you to have, be sexually intimate with a woman, you, to, you need to be celibate. Nevertheless, because of fornication, because of sexual immorality, it's better to marry than to burn. And there, when we see that in the, in chapter, in the rest of chapter 7, then later on, he's going, to say, he's going to say, better to marry than to burn. Burn with lust to commit sexual immorality. 
So let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. So he is talking about, he is talking about here sexual relations within, within a marriage. And you will notice that his tone or his, uh, his writing style differs as to whether when he's talking to married people and especially to married Christians. And then when the tone changes, he talks about those who are married to unbelievers. Now, how much of a problem would that be for Paul in that time? He came and preached initially for a year and a half. What were the chances that people would respond to the gospel and be baptized or immersed into Christ and go home to an unbelieving spouse? A spouse who is still a pagan, a spouse who is still given to offering food to idols, a spouse who is, who is, not, who is not in any way a Christian. So he speaks about that later on in chapter 7. But right now he's speaking to married Christians. He's speaking to those who are, uh, who are, who are married. So it's... Verse 3 talks about the fact that the husband is rendering the, the affection to the wife that is due her. And this affection is to be returned likewise, the husband to her, uh, the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the man does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. So what he's talking about here is in a marriage that there is sexual intimacy between the two. And he goes on to say, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time. Now, what, are, what, what, is, the, what, is, what is the man or the woman depriving the other of? Intimacy. Sex is not to be used as a weapon. Sex is not to be used as a weapon. Intimacy is not to be used as a weapon. Now, if you have a spouse who is ill, obviously, Paul doesn't have to say anything about that. If you have someone who's, if you have someone who's, who's a, a spouse who's ill, things like that, Paul doesn't have to talk about those. He's talking about depriving your mate of, of intimacy as a punishment. Do not deprive one another except for consent for a time. There may be times when you have to temporarily abstain from relations to give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And the word fasting there is an added word. The original, in the original Greek, the word fasting is not there. And so the added, give yourselves to fasting and prayer, come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. If you're a, a man or a woman who lacks self-control and you're lacking sexual intimacy, the chances that you are going to stray from your marriage because of this being used as a punishment are much greater. And so Paul says, don't do that. Don't use sex as a weapon against the other. Now, notice in verse 6, he says, but I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. What he's saying here is, this is, uh, this, is the, this, is a, this is a concession, not a commandment. Christ did not talk about this. So he is saying this as a concession, not as a commandment. So what he says about abstaining is, is the whole idea of marriage is one that the man is respectful of the woman and the woman is respectful of the man. This is a, this, that is a, that is a Christ-centered principle that we are to respect our spouse in marriage. So he says in verse 7, For I wish that all men were even as I myself. This is his preference due to what he will call in verse 26, this crisis that is, that is going to occur, this, this, temp, this tribulation that is coming, that is getting ready to come on these people. And again, in verse 32, this lack of distraction, the distractions that things that are coming are going to cause these things to, to happen and that might affect a marriage, that might put stress on a marriage where one spouse may abandon the other. This is Paul's, what Paul calls his gift of celibacy. And again, Acts 26.10 talks about him voting to have people, to have Christians put to death. So he was a part of the Sanhedrin and to be a part of the Sanhedrin to give the, to cast this vote, he had to be married. So the, the, intimation, the intimation here from him is that in verse, uh, in verse seven, that even, that all men were even as I myself, 
might mean that he, he's, he is unmarried at this time because he is a widower. He is a widower. But he does champion marriage. In chapter 9, verse 5, he champions marriage. He is a great champion of marriage. But he's saying that that, that doesn't work for him. It works for others, but it does not, work, but does not work for Paul because he doesn't want any distraction to keep him from preaching the gospel. All right? So that's verses 1 through 7. Now let's look at verses 8 through 16. Now notice he says here he changes, he changes the course of his conversation. But, that means a change, that's a change in his, his writing style. But, I say to the unmarried and to the widow. So now he's, he's changed who he's talking to. He's changed the group that he's talking to in verses, in verses 8 through 16. Now he's talking to the unmarried and to the widows. It is good for them if they remain even as I am celibate. It is good. But if they cannot exercise self-control, and this is the whole key to this whole chapter, is his constant reference to each individual person being able to maintain their self-control. If you cannot maintain your self-control, he says, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. That type of passion that causes a spouse to stray and to commit fornication or adultery. So, to the married, and then notice he's changed, he changes this again. Now to the married, now he first he talks about to the unmarried and to the widows, that it's good for them to remain as he is. If they cannot exercise that self-control, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. So then, he changes the construct again in verse 10. Now to the married, I command. So he's not talking to the, the married or the unmarried of the widows, now he's talking in verse 10 to the married. Now to the married I command. Yet not I, but who? But the Lord. This is coming straight from, and you don't even have to read any further. You know what Matthew 19 says? You know, you know those, those foundational scriptures that we're using. Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And the husband is not to divorce his wife. Now, those two verses right there are speaking to, specifically to, because of the next few verses, these two verses are speaking st strictly to married Christians. So, this is a man and wife who'd heard Paul preach. They were married and they came, they both obeyed the gospel. They were both immersed and now they're married Christian couples. This is his command to them, yet not I, but the Lord. This is to married Christian couples. Now watch when he switches here, but to the rest. Well, what are the rest? The rest are one partner is a Christian, the other is not. Okay? So now he's talked to the married Christian couples. He's saying the husband is not to depart, the wife is not to depart, but to be reconciled. Now he says, but to the rest. But to the rest, I... Not the Lord, because the Lord had not talked about, Jesus did not speak about believers marrying unbelievers. He talked in broad terms about marriage. But with the coming crisis, with this coming tribulation that's coming, he's going to give advice to those who are married, but married to either the, the, the husband or the wife is an unbeliever and the other is a Christian. Does this happen in our society today? Do we know of folks who are married that the husband is a Christian or the wife is a Christian and the, and the husband is not? Yeah, we all know about that. We all, we, can, we, all know, we all know individuals who are like that, who are in that situation. But to the rest I, but to the rest I say, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who does not believe. Okay, now he's talking to a brother, a Christian who has an unbelieving wife. Could be the other way around. Could be husband with an unbelieving wife, wife with an unbelieving husband. If you have an unbelieving husband, a wife who, but to any brother has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. So all through, all through this, this chapter, verses 1 through 40, Paul is giving advice about not changing your status, your marital status, giving the tribulation that's coming, the persecution that's coming to the house of God. 
There is tribulation coming, and Paul says this is not the time because this tribulation will set additional stress, will place additional stress on the marriage. Look at our society today. What are the pressures that are put on couples, that are put on married couples today? Financial pressures, spiritual pressures, especially if one is a believer and one is not. The additional stresses put on married couples today are in large part responsible for the divorce rate. This is no different than in Paul's time. This is no different. Mankind has not changed. Stress elicits confrontation between two people who are otherwise happy in a marriage. Things go wrong. Things happen. A man loses his job. A woman loses her job. There's, there's stress in the marriage. And what happens? They break up. They split. One commits adultery. One commits fornication with another person. Adultery requires three people. Fornication only requires two. Something happens to break that marriage. And Paul says, the message of chapter 7 is, despite what's going on in society, despite your problems, you all stay together. You all stay together. But to the rest, I not the Lord say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe. So now he's taking the other side of the coin. A woman who has a husband who did not, does not believe. If he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. What does, the, what does the one Christian member of that marriage have to offer the other? Hope that what? That by your righteous lifestyle, doesn't Paul say something about, by the fact that you're living a righteous lifestyle, what will that cause the other to possibly do? Become a Christian. You might convert that person. So Paul says you're not to just, when the stress of the marriage gets such that you just want to abandon this and run off, you don't need to do that because the fact that you're in this marriage can serve as an inspiration and as hope to the, un, to the unbelieving spouse. And so again he says no matter what the distraction, no matter what the stress, don't change, don't let the world, don't let the tribulation change you. And a woman who has a husband, verse 13, who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let him not divorce her. For the unbelieving husband, here it is, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. An unbelieving spouse married to a, married to a Christian, to a believing spouse, they do not have unrighteous or unholy children. Children are a blessing from God. Children are also another reason for that believing spouse to continually work to convert that unbelieving spouse. Okay? So the children in the marriage are holy because, they, because children are a gift from God. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. No matter what else happens in this relationship, the marriage the marriage must be peaceable. The marriage must be peaceable. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Speaking directly to the believing spouse, whichever one it is, the wife or the husband, how do you know that what you're doing by living the Christian life, by living your example in front of that, um, the other unbelieving spouse, how do you know that you won't convert them? That's exactly what he's saying. So down through verse 16. So, yes, sir, go ahead. Isn't this passage used by a lot of people in the church that are not believers? Yeah. And they think that they're sanctified, Sure, sure. Yeah, there are a lot of people, and I, I, you know, I, I was thinking about this as I was putting the class together, and we could probably do a whole 13-week session on this one chapter. I mean, this, could, this could be a whole 13-week session. Not that I'd want to teach it, you know, because getting up here in front of you and talking about sex is, you know, it's just not, you know, it's not, it's not, not high on my priority list of things to talk about. But, you know, and my wife cautioned me this morning, you know, she goes, just think about what you're saying. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm trying my best, huh? So, marriage above all things, you know, is peaceable. This chapter is, he's entirely correct. This chapter has been taken. 
This chapter has been twisted. This chapter has been, has been taken stuff out of context, which makes it pretext. They, they, people take stuff out of this and they twist it and they turn it every different way. The fundamental scriptures on marriage, divorce, and remarriage have not changed since Matthew 19. Paul will never contradict Christ. Mike. Correct. 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 But what he's saying here is the, is the one believing spouse, because that marriage is sanctified, and I agree with Mike that that marriage, if you're married to an unbeliever, that marriage is sanctified just like if you're both Christians. Now he's going to talk about later, if one of the spouses dies, that the dynamic changes. But he's saying right now, you live peaceably with that person. That marriage is, that marriage is sanctified whether that person is a believer or unbeliever. Not saying anything about not saying anything about divorce. That hasn't changed, and Paul is not contradicting Christ in this, in anything that he says. So there's no sanction in verse 15, to his point. There is no sanction in verse 15 given to divorce. It's based this is all based on Matthew 19. But it would still go back to the, the, the fact that if he was to marry somebody else, that he would be committed adultery. That is correct. That's correct. And we could go on, and you know, that you could chase that, we can chase that rabbit hole, and it would take probably a 13 week course just to chase all the different rabbit holes that people want to go down to try to justify that thing. Matthew 19 is very clear. There is a guilty party, there is an innocent party, and Christ is very clear, very clear on, on what it takes to have a marriage that is correct. And that's not me saying that. That's Christ saying that. So you, you have a problem with me. You don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with Christ. Because that's what Christ said in Matthew 19. Okay? All right. So verses uh, 17 through 24. Marriage is a calling. 17 through 24. But as God has distributed to each one as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called as a slave? Do not be concerned about it, but if you were made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who's called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. So, marriage is a calling. The Christian who is married to a non-Christian, the stress again should not force that person to leave the marriage because Above the marriage is a higher calling, and that is the calling of Christ. That is the calling that we have as Christians. And so Paul is saying, don't abandon your marriage just because of this. Live as that example to a non-Christian. In connection with the circumcision, non-circumcision, look at Colossians 2.14. With regard to the slavery portion of this, that is, not, that is not the biblical ideal, okay? Slavery is not the biblical ideal. Bibli slavery is, is something of man. Slavery is not something of God. Yes, we are slaves to Christ because we are, we've been born again. Christ owns us as Christians. We do his bidding. He owns us. But slavery in these days was not the ideal, yet there were many Christians who were slaves there were many people who were poor that were Christians. And so what Paul is saying here is that since you were bought with a price, you are not to become the slaves of men because you are slaves of who? You're slaves of Christ. He bought you. He paid for you. You are not your own. 
You see so many people with their signs that say, my body, my choice. No, it's not your body. It's not your choice. You were bought with a price. And in that glorify God. And so Paul talks about this business of, of uh, uh, these cultural, in verses 23 and 24, he talks about these cultural domestic relationships. They have to be in harmony. Even if one of the people in the marriage is an unbeliever, these marriages have to be in harmony with the will of God. And you living as an example to that unbeliever in your marriage, that living with that unbeliever, being an example to that unbeliever is surely the best way to convert that person and save a soul from death. So verses 25 uh, through 40, I believe are the last ones. And I can't tell by, let me look at my clock. How much time? Do I, okay, I think I can get through this. All right, verses 25 through 40. This is the largest, this is the largest group of, of scriptures. And in verses 25 through 40, he now goes back to speaking again to who? The unmarried and to the widows. Okay, verses 25 through 40. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord. Yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. Christ said nothing about virgins. That's what Paul was saying. Christ didn't say anything about this, but I'm considered trustworthy to deliver the word of God. So I'm going to tell you, I suppose, therefore, verse 26, I suppose, therefore, that it is good because of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as he is. So we have male virgins and we have female virgins. Sometimes when people say virgin, they just think of the woman automatically. That's not so. There are male virgins and there are female virgins. And so he's saying here that he has no commandment from the Lord, but he's going to, based on the trustworthiness that God has granted him through the inspired pen, that because of the present distress, there's that present distress in verse 26, okay? The current state he is speaking of in the, pre in the present, uh, in, in the, in, he's spoken of in the previous verses, this current state, this current state of distress is, the, is what he has talked about in the verses prior to this. Now he's talking about in verses 26 through 28, this future state, these perilous times to come, the coming tribulation. I suppose there, therefore, verse 26, that it is good because of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as he is. This constancy that we see through verses 1 through 40, this constancy of remaining where you are, remaining as you are, not 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 doing different things because of this. Are you bound to a wife? Verse 27. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Now, remember in this day and age, and this again is from the research that I did this week on the culture and, and sex in, in ancient Greece. It does it surprise you that all the marriages in this day and time were arranged. All the marriages were arranged. Now, the, the parents would arrange a marriage for their daughter, and they would have to produce something for the groom. What's that called? Yeah. A dowry. Could be some land, could be some money. This was all stuff that was given to the man in marriage, but he held it in abeyance such that if he died, she had something to live on. But everything for the most part in the marriage, not surprisingly, was the man's. Because women were not given much status in Greek society. Women were passive. Men were dominant. And this is dominance across the board. Dominance in the marriage, dominance in sexual intimacy, dominance at every turn. Wherever you, whatever you want to think of about a, a marital relationship, man was dominant, woman was passive. And so Paul is saying here, that the virgin wants to marry and the, and the father, and he talks about the father here in just a few minutes, she's not sinned, nevertheless such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. And so he's talking about this future state uh, that's going to come about. But this I say, verse 29, brethren, the time is short. So that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. This time of tribulation is coming under this Roman emperor and the four that follow him. These times of tribulation are coming. 
Those who weep as though they did not weep, those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use this world are not misusing it for the form of this world is passing away. The Christian should remain free, Paul is saying, from all unnecessary distractions and focus on one thing. And what is that one thing? The faith. Focusing on the faith. It's no different for us today. It's no different for us today. I quit watching the news. I told you all that some time ago. I can't watch the news anymore. I can't, I can't watch Lord Voldemort. I, I just, I, I, can't, I can't watch the guy. I can't, I, I can't watch, I won't even say his name. I can't watch him. I can't watch what he's doing to this country. But that cannot distract me. These type of things cannot, <clears throat> should not distract the Christian. Should not distract the Christian for contending for the faith once delivered. No matter who you are, as a Christian, the things of this world should not be distracting you. You should be focusing on preserving the faith, maintaining the faith. And that's what Paul is saying here. Verse 32, but I want you to be without care for who he who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Now that the opposite of that is that he, that he who is married doesn't care as much for the things of the Lord. And that's what he's saying. You can't, you can't be like that. In whatever state you're in, you need to care for the things of the Lord, how you may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world and how he may please his wife. And there's the distractor. And that's why Paul says, I wish that you all were even as I am, celibate. But if you have to marry, it's better to marry than to burn. But he who marries cares about the things of the world, not the things of the Lord, how he may please his wife. Now, there is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So it's the woman caring about the things of the world and pleasing her husband and the man caring about the things of the world and pleasing his wife. And the unmarried have the advantage, the celibate have the advantage that if they can maintain this celibate lifestyle, they will be more pleasing to the Lord because they think about the things of the Lord, not the things of the world. Okay. All right. So I, uh, verse 35, and, and this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. That's the bottom line. That is everything. Serving the Lord without distraction. Your marriage should not be one that causes you to lose your focus on God. So Paul says, serve the Lord without distraction. But if any man thinks he is behaving improperly toward his virgin... If she is past the flower of her youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let them marry. So if, she, if the virgin, whether male or female, needs to get married, they, they need to marry because the, the opposite of that, if they, can't main, they cannot maintain the celibacy, is even worse. Nevertheless, verse 37, nevertheless. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will and has so determined in his heart that he will not keep his version does, does well. So then he who gives her in marriage, the father, he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. In other words, if the father says, yes, I'm going to give you in marriage and give you this dowry, he does well. But the father who says, no, I don't want you to be married. I want you to remain celibate does better. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes. What are the last four words there? What does that mean? Every contemporary Christian scholar, including scholars of the Church of Christ, says that means a widow must marry in the Lord. And everywhere I see the word or the phrase in the Lord, what does that mean? Well, not, not in the Lord, but, but the other person has to be a Christian. That's what it means to be in the Lord. When you're in the Lord, you're a Christian. Sure.
It's the same phrase, right. And what I think that what that means is that's God's will. And I think what Paul is saying, she's married to who she will. Yes, she will, yes. She's not free to be married to who she will. She can't marry another man who's already married. She can't marry another woman. She can't marry a man who's a divorce. She can't marry a man who's a divorce. She must marry in accordance with God's will. And what does, that, what does that say about this whole 40 verses that he's talking about? You've been married to a man who's a Christian your whole life, and he dies. Or maybe you're married to an unbeliever, and that unbeliever dies. Now you have the opportunity, because you're free to marry, don't go marry another unbeliever. You marry in the Lord. You weren't married in the Lord before. You were married to an unbeliever. Now that unbeliever has died. You're free to marry. But now God says, why don't you marry in the Lord? Why don't you marry someone that's a, that's a Christian like you are? That's what I, th that's what I think it means. Yes, Dwight. I remember one time I was speaking to a man whose wife had died. And I said, if you want to go to this and watch him, I said, yes, he died. Everything, everything in this chapter flows both ways. Right, civil di civil divorce and divorce under God's law are two different things. Right, right, right. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, Paul Paul spends a lot of time talking about the law of man versus the law of God. You know, you're supposed to obey the laws of the land, except when? When they contradict the law of God. If, if, if Voldemort put out a thing tomorrow that said, I'm supposed to do something that violates God's law, well, I'm going to jail, I guess. I guess that's where y'all have to start a prison ministry. Because that's where I'm going to be. And in verse 40, he concludes everything by saying that he's doing all this, that he's doing all this with and under the control of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is guiding what he's saying. He's guiding what he's writing in these 40 verses of chapter 7. So hopefully Hiram may want to cover some of the other stuff after he watches this next week. He may totally just reverse everything and say, don't listen to that guy. But anyway, that's, verse, that's chapter 7. We'll start next week, chapter 8, with offering meat to idols. Or he will. You don't hear...